I'm Erica Lukes, host of UFO Classified. For me, life isn't simply black and white. Life is full of many unknowns. It is my goal to travel the world and to work with the world's leading experts in the hopes of making groundbreaking discoveries. Join me on UFO Classified Friday nights at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, only on KCOR. Turn left and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact, fiction, or the truth. You decide. And now... The new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Good afternoon, good evening, my friends. I'm Erica Lukes. I was happy to be here, as you know, every Friday night with people from all over the world. I have the best listeners on the planet because they are respectful, they are educated, they understand that there are lots of pitfalls and uh, smoke screens that are being put forth with regard to a very, very important subject. We deserve the truth. We deserve integrity. And as most of you know who follow this subject, we're certainly not getting it. That is my goal, and that is why I'm here every week. I spend hours a week researching specific topics and talking with people. I have a lot of files and a lot of good investigations that I have done that I'm putting together. And each radio show, I bring on people to kind of build on the, the, the prior radio show. So if you go back and, and listen, you'll see that. And you'll also see, if you go back to my archives in the, at the beginning of when I started this, you'll also see my journey and my opinions change as I become more immersed in ufology and also in my exploration of the subject. It's really interesting to see. And I know we're all, all right there. This is a listener-supported show, and I appreciate so many of you who have taken the time to make monthly donations to keep UFO Classified on the air. It is truly the only radio show that I can think of other than, well, actually, I can think of a couple more. Greg Bishop is a big, uh, I I really respect him, but you're not going to find radio shows out there where actual researchers are doing the radio show, and you're also not going to find a show that does not survive on advertising money. I'm not beholden to anyone. And that makes this show my own and and very unique. So thank you to all of those who take the time to donate to the show. You can visit my website at ufoclassified.com or ericalukes.com. I'll be updating things. I'm also starting to publish a newsletter from my friend, Gordon Lore. We are co-authoring a book together that will be out for the holidays, and that will be the the story of my life and some of my investigations and travels to unique locations around the world. I'm excited for that. Gordon Lohr is an amazing author. He's contributed a lot to the field, so check him out as well. Listen to my shows with Gordon. He is one of my, my dear friends. I adore him. I want to say right now, I, my focus is on Utah. At the moment, we've got so much coming out. As you know, over the past few months, I have interviewed Chris Marks, who worked for Bass, who lived at Skinwalker Ranch, Chris Bartell, who worked alongside Chris. I am getting more and more people to come forward, and I'm also taking some of the interviews that I've done over the years, and I'm getting those out to the public. This is a very interesting story that will be unfolding, and I would be willing to bet that what we know or what we thought we knew about Skinwalker Ranch or what was told to us 15 years ago is certainly not going to be what we're going to be learning coming up. So anyway, there you have that. With my focus being on my home state, Utah, I have developed a lot of good friendships And I've also had the opportunity since I became public on the subject to have people that normally would not come forward who live in Utah come to me and tell me about specific sightings. A person that I met is my guest for the first half an hour of the show. She has been very supportive. I appreciate her. She's a strong and intelligent woman who cares very much about the integrity of this topic. And I want to to say, Adrienne, thank you so much for not only being my friend and being an incredible woman, but also for <clears throat> your, your wishing and wanting to see integrity in the subject. Oh, of course. Absolutely. I look forward to everything that I learned from you and your podcast. And uh, I've 
been knowing you, I would say, the last five years since I moved back home, and it's been a joy. Thank you. Absolutely. We've had a lot of fun together. So, <laughs> you yeah, and, you know, we've... <laughs> I, and we need to get, I need to go hang out with you. We need to go get coffee. So I let's know, do that. I know, I know. We need to have a little girl chat. So how, I want to know, how did you first become interested in this topic? You know, uh, Erica, since I was a kid, much like yourself, and when I was a young child, I had a sighting here in Salt Lake, um, which I really didn't think much of it because I had been tuned in to the paranormal, uh, didn't think there was anything abnormal about that until I became an adult. But when I really got interested in it was when I was living in New Mexico, uh, as I traveled around the States as a nurse. And I had been meditating quite a bit and uh, had always meditated, I have to tell you, since as far back as I can remember, but had been meditating a lot because I had been through a lot. I had just been through Hurricane Katrina and was just recovering and, you know, and that sort of thing. And I'm driving down the road was during the day and I got a very distinct message in my mind that said, take a picture. And I had never gotten that kind of a message before. I've gotten other messages when I dream or meditate or what have you. So I just got out my phone and I started clicking pictures. And I didn't think much of it. And about a couple of days later, I looked at a series of pictures. And in one of them, I saw something like a glare in the sky. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And at this point, I wasn't tuned in to MUFON or anything ufology at all. So I just opened up the picture and, you know, enlarged it on my phone. And it was too, I guess the, the way I could describe the shape would be like macaroons. I have to relate it to food, of course, but um, it looked like two, <laughs> I know, two silver uh, macaroons that were like stacked on top of each other. And so from there forward, I really started getting more and more touch with some of the experiences that I had as a child and really started taking seriously the lucid dreaming that I'd had throughout my life as a child and some of the messages that I'd been giving to people. And so I really just kind of started diving in. And then 2011 was the first time I went to uh, the Roswell Festival, and that's when I met Stan Friedman. And I believe that year was the last fairly close to um, the rancher. I can't, I'm so sorry, I can't remember his name, but he was still alive. Mac, was it Mac? I can't remember. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, so I started um, my journey, and then it's been pretty uh, interesting and pretty intense and, and pretty heavy from there forward in a wonderful way, but I see the world very differently. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. And so talk about your sighting that you had as a child. So I was in about seventh or eighth grade, um, and I was on the balcony of our apartment that we lived in. And I saw what looked like a, uh, a glowing disc. I mean, it just looked like a disc. And so I started, you know, yelling um, for my mom and my brother to come out and look. And, and they looked at it. I don't even know if they remember this event, but I remember them looking, you know, as a kid, you kind of, you have these memories that just stick with you for some mm -hmm. reason. And I remember both of them looking at it with some shock, but my mom didn't say anything. And my brother is um, very matter of fact, you know, very, he's a computer geek, very intelligent, very bright, was in the military, was, you know, a radar specialist. And he looked at it and had this shocked look. And then he finally said, oh, it's nothing. It's, it's just a plane, you know? And I remember thinking to myself, you know, me and my brother as little kids went with my dad every weekend to the small airport to watch planes. I knew what planes looked like and I knew what the lights looked like on planes. And, and I just remember in my young little mind thinking, gosh, it's not a plane, but okay. My big brother says it's a plane. <laughs> and you right. know, and that, that was that. So where were you? Where, what part of Salt Lake did you live in? Um, we lived on uh, Ninth East and about First South was where our apartment was at that time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm certainly hearing a lot, especially lately, from, from people um, who are coming forward who have had sightings in that specific area. 
So it's fascinating to me. And, and I mean, do you, do you remember what direction you were facing? Uh, yes, I was facing West. Mm-hmm. So would it have been over kind of where the Ochre Mountains are or more to the airport, the Salt Lake International? More to the Ochre Mountains. And that, again, that is a very unusual um, place. There, there's a, We have, since the we've got the NSA here and Dugway Proving Ground and right. UTTR and things like that, we have a lot of um, restricted airspace. And and as you and I both know, because we've, you know, worked on this research, this, you know, there have, we have the flight corridors to the international airport and, and different things. But in some of those areas over the Ochre Mountains, that is, it's, you know, it's it's very unusual to see Fascinating. things. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I did have some other minor sightings um, when I was in New Mexico that appeared to be just uh, glowing balls that would just glow and shoot up really quickly and disappear. So I've, I've had a couple. And what's interesting is for some reason, it's just never, I guess, since that childhood experience that I had that didn't frighten me, it's I've never really thought it that big of a deal, even though it it's fabulous and amazing to me. It just seems so normal that there's things out there that we, we don't know and we don't have proof one way or another. So let's just look at it and let's get together and let's talk about it and let's figure it out. You, you know, you would, you would think so. Um, yeah. Yeah, one would think. <laughs> but in a science. rational yeah. people or perhaps <laughs> people who are medicated and can handle life change. I don't know, whatever, but yeah, it's, yeah. it is interesting. Um, so what else, I mean, have you had any sightings lately? I did last year when I was out at the great salt Lake, um, was, and I haven't gone through all of those pictures yet. And I, and I really need to, um, but I was again, facing West and there all of a sudden, um, I was looking, you know, over the water there and there was a silver shining, darting kind of moving object. And I'm looking and looking and looking and all of a sudden it disappears and I couldn't find it again. So as I took subsequent pictures after that, and the person I was with also took some pictures that appears like we caught some orbs. Some of the pictures that I did look at appear to be likely um, just sunlight or weird, you know, from the sunset or weird kind of glare that just can really be debunked. But there's a couple that look interesting that I just haven't really gone through yet. And so that would have been um, almost a year ago, November, because it was around my birthday. Interesting. And, and so what, what if you, because I know that you're very connected here in Utah, um, with regard to sightings, um, and, and people that have experiences, what have you heard lately uh, as far as any activity taking place in Salt Lake or Utah? You know, I actually have kind of disconnected myself recently, Um, so other than hearing about orbs and just various people that I've talked to in my own, you know, kind of friend circle that have seen some stuff up in the Bountiful area, just orbs and flashing lights that don't seem normal. I've, I haven't really gotten into any deep discussions because I've kind of taken a break because I felt like, um, you know, there was just a lot of interesting chatter going on in ufology and I just needed a break. So other than just my friends that I um, work with or used to work with up in Bountiful, just some strange orbs and lights that they wouldn't normally expect. And that's really been the extent of my conversations. And and that's interesting. And we need to get together and kind of maybe, maybe we can both do some interviews with them and and figure things out. Ben Hansen, who is a, uh, a TV personality and researcher, has he, his family is from Bountiful, and oh, we've spoken yeah at great length about some of the sightings that they have had in the Bountiful area. And I was working for quite a while with a woman who'd had who'd seen very similar types of things. You know, the balls of light, 
um, in that area. So that seems to be another one of those areas and whether it's, whether it's something that they're testing or, I mean, there are lots of things to rule out first, but it's, it is, it's quite curious. So it is curious. And and I always wonder too, just coming from, you know, my perspective being an energy healer and worker and whatever you want to call it. I always wonder, are we seeing more sightings because people are more willing to talk about it or, are we seeing more sightings because just as human beings, as a collective, we're becoming more open? I mean, it is interesting. I don't, and I don't know the answer to that. And it may be multifactorial. I don't know. Right. Absolutely. It, it's, it is interesting. I think people are paying more attention. And now with all of the things hitting the media and, and right. things, people might actually look up, get off their cell phone and look up and pay attention to their surroundings. Absolutely. And, and be more vulnerable and talk about these experiences without being laughed at and try and figure it out. Right. I mean, did you, you know, since we live in a very conservative state, did you ever have any, did you ever feel any uh, insecurity about maybe coming forward and talking about some of these things? Oh, for sure. For sure. Like people just don't take you seriously or they're just so, and I think we've just been conditioned as humans, but that people are so quick to, just laugh and say, Oh, you, you mean you're going to talk about your abduction now? Or, you know, I'm like, what abduction? So I, I felt uh, very afraid uh, to be vulnerable and, and just lose my credibility in, in anybody's eyes. But I think that's really important that we stop behaving like that as individuals and as humans and that we allow this vulnerability of these experiences that people are having to come forth and and they don't have to be this great grand grandiose experience if it's just something as simple as seeing you know lights let's describe it what time was it what did it look like which way were you facing how far away do you think you were how big was you know those kind of things right yeah but i definitely um and even still, I, but I just think I, as you get older, it's the, the beauty about getting older is you just kind of learn that you just don't really care what people think about you. It's beautiful. Well, I guess you got to have a plus to getting older. Because <laughs> I'm looking in the mirror and I'm, I'm guys, glad that you gave me that little self-help moment. Thank you. Oh, yes. It's so true. <laughs> it's, you know, I think it, it, it is interesting. I remember when... You know, I had my series of, of sightings that kind of pushed me to come forward publicly. I mean, I remember there was a, a time when I was just getting ready to post something on, on Facebook and I just sat back and I went, thought to myself, oh my gosh, if I do this, you know, what is it going to mean for my family? What will it mean for my business? What will it mean for, right. you know, and, and so it was very, I had to be very methodical about the way I approached it. And even talking to my clients that come into the studio, it's like, you know, I, I could, um, bombard them with lots of crazy stuff. Right. Or I could say, here is an important scientific study taking place here. Here are, you know, factual reports from here. And if you, if you approach it, as you know, in, in a, a dedicated and educated way, people really can't argue with exactly. you. Yeah. Well, and you remove the, the fear and the stigma because when you're coming from a place of fear, it's, you know, it's really hard to express yourself freely. So coming from a, from a scientific point of view and removing the fear and the stigma really allows people to step out and examine that, gosh, there might be something beyond um, planet Earth that is worth investigating and, and researching and let's collaborate and, and do it together. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> right, right. I know yeah, exactly. I mean, and and I think you know you mentioned briefly, um, you know, the lights in the sky kind of thing. And I, I want to just throw in there, I as 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 a researcher, the biggest mistake I've seen other researchers make is to dismiss lights in the sky cases. Absolutely, they automatically and dismiss. They do. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do. And it's it, I can't tell you how many you know people <laughs> I've. Oh no, it's blah 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 blah. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. You know, you're you're saying it's A, B, C, and D when you're not even researching, investigating it. You're not, you don't know, you know, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And so we really need to kind of, um, you know, we, we can't use, we can't put our own belief systems onto this. Correct. Yeah. Because I would rather have a sighting be categorized as unknown as opposed to just some, someone saying, oh, that was lights or bugs or a plane. Or If you don't know and you've done your research, then leave it as unknown. 
that would be a miracle. <laughs> oh, again, <laughs> hope springs but that you know that ego it just gets in the yeah. way, doesn't it? If that's one of the biggest things in um, ufology that kind of made me take a little bit of a break is. If any of us, I mean, myself included, um, in the field that I'm in, if you let your ego get in the way, you are going to miss tons of stuff. You're going to miss opportunities to connect with people. You're going to miss, you know, all kinds of um, potential great projects that you can work on. But yeah, ego really does mess things up in more ways than one. You are not kidding. That and um, maybe a little bit of a uh, uh, mental delusion. <laughs> delusion. There's some. Yes. It's, and and I have to ask you. Cultish. And that. Right. And when it, it yeah, does. When it, yeah, it when is it becomes so scary. Cultish, yeah, you kind of. Then you turn people off that are maybe on the fence that could be helpful to the picture. When you become cultish and you start ganging up on other people, you turn people away, and that's just not the way to go. And right. And, yeah, we need to start speaking up when we see that happen. And uh, when we see it happen to our colleagues, we really need to start speaking up. And I know that you've had to deal with a lot of that. And we, we need to, to speak up so that people can freely be researching this without being, uh, you know, just beaten down. It's, it's just not going to work. Yeah, th thank you. I, yeah, it is. It's interesting, and I have to ask you. I mean, how how prevalent do you think uh, sexism is in in the field of ufology? I think just as a, very much so, I do, and I think as a society that we're still dealing with a whole new paradigm of how we just look at human beings as human beings and not objectify them based on sex or looks or lack thereof. And so I have experienced it in ufology to a much smaller degree than what you've experienced, but we do need to talk about it because it's not helping us. It's not helping no, it's, it's really interesting. I think, unfortunately, we've kind of allowed, um, it, we've allowed a lot of unfortunate behavior. And like you said, we have an, a responsibility to each other to stand up and speak out about that when we see other people getting hurt. I know that um, there are a couple of my colleagues that have been going through the same types of things, and, and it is really nasty and unfortunate. And I just wanted to kind of shine a spotlight on some of the other quote-unquote leaders in the field who have absolutely no backbone and wouldn't know what integrity was if it hit them on beside the, you know, upside the head. And I think we, you know, we need to, this is an important subject and it deserves respect. Yeah. It just, we need to, to involve people that are professional and, and know how to address it. And when we see uh, bullying or harassment or uh, just this gang stalking kind of mentality, we absolutely need to protect each other. Yeah, we, we do have to speak up. We do have a duty. And I think people are so afraid of confrontation. And, and again, here comes that fear word. And coming from my <laughs> work, you know, fear is crippling and it doesn't serve you or anyone else. And so when we're too afraid to speak up and we're too afraid to hold people, <clears throat> excuse me, accountable for their behavior, we allow it to continue. And so, in the, yeah, in this field as, as much, we have to start speaking up and holding people accountable. And you can do it in a way that's not, you know, Great right. to somebody. Absolutely, absolutely. Adrian, thank you so much for being here. I look forward to having coffee with you soon. I can't I, wait. I know. I'm Erica Lukes, and I'm going to be up next with my friend Jen, who's had some unusual sightings in a different part of Utah. So stick around. We'll be right back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702 425 9230. That's 702 425 9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Are you ready? Ready to go inside the Matrix? Inside the Matrix. You see, whoever controls technology controls the world. Then tune in Sundays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern 
as your host, Jimmy Brent, takes you deep inside the holographic matrix. Carefully designed to stimulate the mind. Come explore a world of topics from technology, archaeology, spirituality, and so much more. Inside the matrix will liberate you from the manipulated, parasitic entities of consciousness. You guys ready for this? It's time to claim your true natures as creative, divine beings. Inside the matrix, hosted by Jimmy Brent. Who are we talking about? Jimmy Brent. Live Sundays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Inside the Matrix, investigating and analyzing the experience of life. 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 Toxins are everywhere, from the air we breathe to the food we eat and the water we drink. In a world where 80,000 known toxins and heavy metals threaten our very existence, how are you going to protect yourself and your loved ones? Introducing Pure Body Extra Strength, the world's first collodial zeolite that helps trap and remove toxins as well as heavy metals from your body that are messing with your memory, clarity, sleep, and focus. Don't just take our word for it or the testimonials from our thousands of happy customers. Check out the hundreds of articles and case studies on the National Institute of Health website proving zeolite's powerful ability to remove toxins. For a limited time, listeners to KCOR will receive 10% off their first order. To get started, go to trypurebody.com and enter promo code Radio 10. Again, that's trypurebody.com. Toxic junk is all around us, but now you can take back control of your health and protect yourself by detoxing with Pure Body Extra Strength. You'll be on your way to sleeping better, thinking more clearly, and feeling more energetic. Go to trypurebody.com right now and get started today. Now, broadcasting in digital HD radio. shadows a voice cries out evidence that you're not alone you said my name what is your name proof that the living and the dead coexist or do they every wednesday night 6 p.m pacific 9 p.m eastern join writer producer and paranormal investigator greg bakken on ghost box radio as he explores interviews and investigates evidence alongside some of the best in the paranormal community and beyond. Six people killed. Ghost Box Radio, Wednesday nights exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Because the dead don't sleep. Ghost Box Radio. KCOR Digital Radio Network. Broadcasting from the heart of Las Vegas, Nevada. Their base is so large, it has to draw most of its power from nearby nuclear fusion plants. The future of radio is here and now. 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 You're listening to. You're listening to. You're listening to. UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name, KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chats at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now... Your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. Happy to be here with my friends and see Northern and David and Doug and Susan and, and everyone. I really appreciate all of your support. I want to give a shout out to my friend and very talented artist, Irv Brock. Uh, I want to thank Andrew and Christopher and all sorts of wonderful people who care enough about the show to support it. Um, I really feel that we deserve the best information and we're simply not getting it in the field of ufology and we're also i believe being manipulated by the powers that be with with things coming out they're trying to instill a sense of fear and all of these things so we need to be on top of our game right now is a very important time in history i am here tonight with different people who have had experiences in my home state utah uh, Adrian was on the first half an hour, and now I've got my friend who I've known forever, for probably 25 years. Is that right, Jen? 
Oh my gosh. Are you now you're dating our age. I know. Okay. That's <laughs> well, we, we won't mention that on the air, but I mean, we've known each other for a long, long time. And the crazy thing is we knew each other, you know, we worked out at the gym together and, and things, and it took us how long to figure out that we were actually, that you were married to one of my, my cousins. <laughs> Well, hey, that's a Utah thing, isn't it? it got, yeah, <laughs> now that you put it that way. <laughs> that's pretty scary. <laughs> yes, I've been married to your cousin for 27 years, 31 years total. We've been together, and here I am still in Utah. Go figure. Yeah, but you moved, so you're out of Salt Lake, and you are in a really beautiful part of Utah now. I am, and one of probably, I mean, in my opinion, other than the southern Utah area, um, midway, the Heber Valley, Wasatch County is absolutely stunning. Breathtaking. It is gorgeous. It is gorgeous. And I want to say, you know, too, I actually have had a couple other people, um, very in influential in the community reach out to me because, and they live very close to you because their whole family had had a series of sightings, very interesting encounters in that area. And so I'm, I, that's why I want to get you on here so you can open the floodgates and tell people what's going on where you live. Well, you know, it's interesting because you just gave me goosebumps because when I first moved here, Erica, about three and a half years ago, I literally thought I was insane. I, you know, had, I just was taking a new series of supplements and I thought, oh my gosh, I said to my husband, I'm like, am I hallucinating? Like we've lived here for only a few months and I'm seeing stuff all over these skies and I'm wondering if it's what I'm taking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because, you know, I was new in the, I seriously, I was new in the Valley. And um, like I said, I'm not accustomed to being in um, clear skies um, like we have in Midway where we have really no night pollution. And I thought, my hell, I'm taking these supplements, which they were just supplements for the autoimmune disorder that I have, but, you know, they were helping me. But I thought, I these things are seriously, it's like, they're crazy, right? And then I realized, no, I'm not taking something that's making me crazy. I'm actually seeing things that are legit. And I have continued to this day, they come in patterns, to see, I don't know, orbs, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's crazy, the stuff that I've seen. And now that I've gone public about it, it is amazing how many people have come out of the woodwork and have said things to me like, oh, my gosh, you won't believe what I saw last night. Or did you see that last Thursday night? I have friends with videos, pictures. It's like I, I feel like I opened, like you say, the floodgate for other people to come forward. So other people will think that you're crazy or that you don't think that you're crazy. So anyhow. And that is so important, Jen. I mean, thank you for doing that because it's, it, it, you know, like I was talking with Adrian the first half an hour, it's hard. It's hard to come forward and talk about things when this subject has been marginalized thanks to people wearing tinfoil hats and, and the United States government. But then, you know, we've got this uh, very conservative community here as well. And so there are lots of things to, to think about when you come forward and you've done it and you've, you've seen a very positive, uh, positive feedback. That's amazing. Yeah, I definitely have. And it's amazing the things that uh, people have shown me because, you know, ironically, the exact things that people have shown me are the exact things that I've seen. So I know for a fact, without a doubt, I don't need anyone to reassure me that what I have seen, you know, people at first were like, oh, it's an airplane. Oh, it's a helicopter. Oh, it's a drone. Oh, it's a satellite. Guess what, people? No, it's not. And yeah, I just think we're seeing more and more of it. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I should ask you, you know, is this, is this common? And I mean, it's probably common across, you know, internationally, right? Absolutely. Um, but just seems, but it seems like I see it in patterns here. Like, a, like March and April are very active. I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, I'm not an educator like you are and other people. Um, 
I can just go by my experiences and what I witnessed, but it seems like it's come in patterns. So absolutely. is that common? Absolutely. absolutely. Yes. And and that's the thing I think you look, you know, when you're, you look at, you know, statistics of sightings, I mean, there seem to be certain months where they, they peak and, and, and different things. And so it is really um, interesting. And I'm glad that you're paying attention to the patterns. That's important. And most people don't. Well, here's the other weird thing. And I haven't even talked to you about this. And I, you know, I've had other people, you know, I've only seen what I've seen in the sky. Okay. Um, I've had other people just re- recently witness on their way to Vernal. Um, these, what, like I said, what, you know, UFOs, whatever you want to so-called, you know, call this um, or these objects coming from underneath the ground. So now I'm really intrigued. And, so, and I am too. And these are legit people. You are too. Yeah. And I, I would love, I would love, love, love to have to, to have a dialogue with them. If there's any way, I mean, oh, and, I, and just to, we need absolutely. to, okay. That would be really wonderful because as you know, this is, I mean, I, it is so important to get all of this information together and to be able to 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 really look at it, and, and I, I would love that. That would mean the world to me. Oh, absolutely. I have a list of people now. I mean, seriously, for the last, like I said, three and a half years that I've lived here, I've been, you know, uh, being able to witness this. And now, because I, like I said, I came out talking about it, and, you know, I'm like, what do I have to lose? I don't know anyone here, Right. Um, right. So people are going to think either this crazy woman moved into Midway or, you know, maybe people will, this will give them the door to, to, to have feedback on what they are actually seeing. And it just happened to go that way that people are like, oh my gosh, you know, and once I started saying what I was exactly seeing, then other people were like, w-, they started watching and then they're like, oh my gosh, that isn't just a star or, oh my gosh, you know, this, this isn't um, a drone. <sighs> so. Yeah, I have a whole list of people who would be happy to talk to you about the same things that I've experienced. Wonderful. And you know what we, I need to do? I need to get um, Chris, uh, my fiance, and we need to come up there and do some some investigating yeah. and do some interviews. I think that would be really fun. Well, that would be great because, like I said, we could have a party. I mean, honestly, for the amount of people that I have that have seen these objects, and now people are saying, I've seen this coming out from underneath the ground. Now, I've not experienced that. I don't know if I want to. But um, <laughs> because what right. I've experienced already, I mean, it's just so, it, it, you know, it's breathtaking. It's strange. It's scary. But at the same time, I'm like, well, it is what it is, you know? And so, so tell anyway. me. So tell us about, because I remember you telling me about your first experience or, you know, when things started to happen for you, can you give our our audience a little taste of what you first encountered? Yes. So I, I, it's very odd. Um, I'm going to try to explain it the best that I can. We, um, our master bedroom has large, very large windows, basically almost to the floor, to the ceiling. And we have shades, so we would just pull, you know, the shades up from the bottom up to not all the way to the top. So you could just see the night, you know, skyline, basically. Um, And so I'm laying in bed, and and all of a sudden I see, you know, out of the side view of my eye, I see this bright light in the sky. And at first I'm thinking to myself, is that a star? Like, you know, I mean, but it's so huge and it's almost this fluorescent uh, white light, if you will. And all of a sudden it just disappeared. It's not like it faded. It literally just went black. And so that's what started, that's what started this all. I started watching very carefully because I kept seeing out of the side view of my right eye, this light. And I just, I, I just, and this is about 11, maybe 10, 11, 15 at night. And it was a Friday night. I'll never forget it. And it, it was like maybe 15 minutes later, all of a sudden I see this, it looked like a shooting star. I'm thinking, what is going on, right? 
And I'm thinking, I'm not going to be able to see a shooting star from my master bedroom window just from the side view of my eye. I just, it didn't make any sense to me, right? It's not like I'm laying on my back in the middle of the desert watching shooting stars. And my husband was asleep. So I'm trying to shake him and wake him up and, and tell him, you know, you got to look at this, right? And he's like, Please, you know, he's sleepy. He's, uh, leave me alone. So I'm just watching and I'm continuing to watch. And that's when I thought I'm hallucinating. I'm like, what in the heck is this? It was about 45 minutes later that I saw this big, bright orange. And again, it's like a neon orange, red color. And it looked, I kid you not, like a planet. It was sitting as clear as day and night, and it was just sitting there. What hovers that's that large that looks almost like a ball of fire in the sky? And then within a matter of seconds, it was gone. And I thought, I'm getting up. That's it. I'm done. I got up and I walked to my living room. Again, big, huge windows. And I'm looking out these windows going, okay, this is taking my breath away. Like, what is this? This is, it was scaring me. And I stood there and I'm not joking. It came back and then I saw it shoot across the, the, the skyline and I could see it. It had moved to another area. And then within a couple of like seconds, not minutes, seconds, it, it was gone again. And then I see this green orb looking thing and it is, it's kind of like it's behind it almost. And then it's gone. Then I was like, okay, that's it. So I kept watching every, and then I I finally fell asleep. Um, And the next night it was kind of the same pattern. I'd see this bright white looking orb light, and then it would just be gone. And then I would sometimes see red. I've kind of seen blue. I've seen green. But mainly what I see is whatever it is that I'm seeing, it just disappears or it, it, it shoots off like it's gone, right, in a matter of seconds. So then I started trying to take a video of it. And that did not turn out that well, obviously. And then I started taking pictures and I was capturing those pictures and I actually captured with my cell phone, if you can believe this, the, the actual object shooting through the sky. So I showed my husband and I said, you know, those real high powered hunting binoculars you have, you need to get those things out because you have to see what I'm seeing. And he's like, you, you've lost your mind. He's like, you have literally <laughs> lost your mind. I said, no, I have not. I said, I swear to you, you have to witness this. This, Please see it and tell me if I am seeing anything. I need you to get those binoculars out so you can see what I'm seeing. Like, tell me what it is, okay? So he's, so one night, this was like four nights after the, the original sighting, okay? He's looking through his binoculars and he's like, oh my gosh, it's so bright. He's like, I can't, and it was hovering low to Erica. It wasn't hovering as high in the sky this time. That was what was even very strange because most of the time it was pretty high, but this particular night it was lower. It was about midnight. Okay. He was looking through the binoculars and he said, this is too bright. I can't even look through my binoculars. And all of a sudden, he's trying to look, and it was gone, just like I had told him. And he goes, well, whatever that was, wasn't normal. (laughs) Well, at least you. he's like, okay. That's good. He's like, I believe you now. He goes, "I, I, I believe you. He goes, I don't know what that was, but that was the strangest thing I've ever seen or witnessed. And then he started seeing things. Okay. Um, he was more aware, if you will, more aware of, um, maybe just watching the sky. I think that's what happens is once you witness something, you're constantly in tune to, you know, Oh, look at the beautiful moon tonight. No, I'm not looking at the beautiful moon. I'm looking (laughs) for whatever else is out there behind the moon. Right. Or on the moon. Right. So, um, Anyhow, he, he had a couple of different experiences too. And my husband, as you know, your cousin, he's not 
like you and I where we're yakkers and talk and socialize a lot. So he's very quiet. But the thing that he witnessed scared the bejesus out of him. And um, he's got his own story that he could tell you driving up Parley's Canyon at 620 at night, coming home from work one night, what literally he experienced. And he walked into the house one night and he looked like Casper the Friendly Ghost. I'm like, why are you so white? And he goes, oh, you will not believe what I just experienced. And I thought, here we are. There's something up here going on. I don't know. I don't know if it's all the lakes we have. I don't know if it is uh, the, the farmland. I have no idea what it is. But anyhow, um, basically, we have seen some very odd sightings. And I've seen probably at least 100, 100 sightings. And, you know, and I think, you know, most people who have never experienced things would, you know, say, are you kidding me? You know, why can't I see one UFO sighting? And it's like, well, whatever. <laughs> because, you know, once you do, once you are tuned in, once you have that initial sighting, I mean, it, it, there are so many other things that go on. There are things that, you know, for me personally that have gone on, you know, in my environment. I mean, there are things interacting all the time. If you pay attention, if you're tuned in. I believe you're right. And see, I was never tuned in before. Now, I did have a sighting. I believe I did tell you about the sighting that I had. It was a few years before I moved, um, uh, you know, moved up to Wasatch County. It was actually in Sugar House where my mother and I witnessed the same thing. Um, it was about 7.45 p.m. And we literally saw, which I would, I would assume would be what we call a flying saucer. I mean, it was the, it was the, the typical looking, uh, thin, silver looking, if you will, saucer um, that literally came out of nowhere. It stopped me dead in my tracks. And I literally almost had an accident because we, we both saw it at the same time. I mean, so there is so much activity going on. And I think, you know, that's the whole thing. Once you see something, it sparks your attention and you definitely, um, it sparks your awareness is what it is. Absolutely. And I have to ask you, you know, when you were talking about your husband's sighting in, in Parley's, uh, or up at Parley's, what, what happened? You know, here, here's the story. And I may miss a few uh, important parts here because obviously he's the one that saw it, not right. me. But right. from what I can, from what I can recall, and this is shortly after, um, you know, this, this spring of March and April events. Because let me, let me make one thing clear. The whole month of that May, I saw nothing. So now we're moving into June, and it was about the second week of June that he's driving up Parley's. And he always, he drives very slow and because he's in a very large work vehicle. So he drives always in the far right lane, very slow going up Parley. So he's traveling up Parley's, and it's, like I said, it's at, it's at dusk. Um, and he, you know, it's pretty cloudy. It's, it's pretty cloudy, and he's looking over. Uh, before you get to Jeremy Ranch, if anyone's familiar with that area, um, it's over off to the left-hand side before kind of between the summit and between Jeremy Ranch right there. He's looking out to the left, and he sees these big black dark clouds, and, he think, and he's thinking to himself, well, we're going to get a big storm. It's coming in any, any time now. And he's kind of looking, and he said, all of a sudden, from, at, from right behind one of the largest black clouds there were to the left, this black looking triangle that had neon blue lights on it literally dropped out of the sky. And when he says dropped, he means literally it went from right behind this big black cloud, it dropped completely down. And he says, where in the hell did it go? I mean, we're talking about the, 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 you know, that area, it's all mountainous. It's filled with aspen trees and tons of foliage pieces. Literally it went and it just, it had to have landed. Like, where did it go? That's the night he came home and looked like Casper, the friendly ghost. He was so white because, and he said it was huge. And he said, how did other people not see this? 
he still is freaked out by it. I bet. He is still to this day freaked out. And the fact that it was dusk and that it was behind a big black cloud. And so the first thing he's thinking is, is it military? Right. And I'm, and so what's your thought on that? I mean, I didn't get to see it. He did. I feel like he was fortunate to see something like that. But could it be military or what, what, what is your thought? I think that is the million dollar question. And I, I, it's, right? I, it's one of those things that who, who knows? Um, I wish I did. I mean, they're obviously <sighs> it, it could be either. And I, I don't know. I really wish it I knew. It was triangle shaped. And he said it was a matte, it was matte black. It was as clear as day and night and it had neon blue lights on it. And so that's the, that's the thing, you know, I didn't, I haven't seen anything like that. I've only seen uh, these objects at night. I have a friend and I kid you not, you have got to contact him or I will have him contact you. So this was, I hadn't seen this. Okay. And these are some of my newer friends that I had, you know, recently met when I moved here. And so my girlfriend's uh, very skeptical of me telling her this. And so she said to her husband one night, she's like, Justin, you've got to hear about, you know, these, these things that my friend has been seeing. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and he, you know, he's lived here his whole life and he's, you know, never witnessed anything like this. Right. Right. So months go by and he is driving down uh, Center Street in uh, in Heber. And he said something captured him out of the side of his eye. And all of a sudden he said he saw it blazing through the skyline over Heber. And he pulled over, he got his cell phone out and started to record this. He has the recording. Okay. He has the photos. All right. You will not believe this. So he okay. captures it and he, he calls me up, right? He's like, you've got to, you've got to see this. So I'm like, okay, I want to go see it. So let, let me come over. You come over. Let me, let me see your, your phone. So I'm you know looking at his picture and, he had not enlarged it, Erica. I enlarged it, and you will not believe it. This is like a mother ship, and there's two behind it. He didn't even know until we enlarged it. You can see the two behind it, and you can see the windows. It well, I, 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 I will be calling you this weekend, and, and <laughs> I will look forward to talking no, to you. No, I'm friend. not kidding you. Okay, I'm, I'm really... <laughs> Stoked about this, and I have to say we're getting ready to 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 go uh, and take our break. But I, Jen, thank you so so much, and I you're an inspiration, and I'm so happy that you're actually putting oh. the word out there. You're getting people to come forward to you, and you're documenting this. That is critical, and I just, I'm excited. We're gonna we're gonna come up there and and visit you, and meet your friends. That's fantastic. I would love for you to do that. Thanks so much for having me on. I just, I love it. And I'm glad that we are able to, again, spark awareness with everyone. I know. You rock. I love it. I will talk to you soon. I'll call you this weekend. I'm Erica Lukes, and we are going to be right back. Chris Marks is up with a never-before-heard interview that he did while he was working for Bigelow. So stick around. The best is yet to come. Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please. (laughs) This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, Visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news. Okay. 
This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. The rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the stopper. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO classified. UFO classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact, fiction, or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO classified. Erica Lukes. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to the second half of UFO Classified. I'm Erica Lukes. Happy to be here on a beautiful fall evening in Utah. I've had on the first hour two of my friends that live here in Utah that have had different experiences. We know, thanks to Jen now, that that Heber, the Heber Valley is an active location. I have been collecting information and different sightings reports from people, but Jen has really been doing an incredible job dealing with the community and, and kind of rallying everybody together to get information out there about that. And I would say that each of us could do this. Uh, it would be very, very helpful. Once you put a bug out, once you start talking about things, you can create a momentum and you can get information. And that is how we're, we're going to make uh, breakthroughs. As most of you know, I have been really, really heavily researching the Uinta Basin and my home state, Utah, for a long, long time. I have spent years collecting reports, sightings reports, investigating cases all over Utah. Utah Lake is a very interesting place. Um, I will say back in the the uh, 60s, there was a great case, Waldo Harris, who was a pilot who witnessed a very unusual thing after he had taken off, as did the observers at the airport on the ground. And this case gets very good because there were actually jets scrambled from Hill Air Force Base. I have the audio recordings of the Hill Air Force Base security guards interviewing seven witnesses that saw this event. It was incredible. And I have also documented over the years different sightings from other people in this area. This is, I want to just throw this out here, in October, uh, October seems to be a very busy month in Utah. Um, October 2nd, 2014, there was a mass daytime sighting that took place over the Salt Lake Valley. I was contacted by Fox 13, a reporter there said that they were getting besieged with different uh, social media. People were posting, they were calling the station, they were photographing, videotaping, these spherical objects, white metallic spherical objects that were hovering over the Salt Lake Valley. These objects hovered by, according to witnesses, many, many witnesses, for upwards of an hour. I did extensive investigations on this case and have a lot of video inter interviews that I conducted. And amazingly enough, the next day, and you can go to YouTube and, and look this up the next day, the same things, the same objects were seen over Breckenridge, Colorado. A great reporter by the name of Matt Renew knew that this was an important case, and so he began to really put out a lot of uh, some feelers to NORAD to he contacted the police department, the FAA. NORAD, of course, did not have any report or they were saying that they didn't have anything, but he's actually interviewed and you can find this on YouTube. Like I'm saying a, a police officer who had witnessed this. And so the same types of objects, this is, this was a huge, huge case. I, as I said, I, when I investigated this, I was state director for MUFON at the time. And it was quite shocking to me that people in MUFON were very willing to write this case off without doing their due diligence. Some of the people that were investigating it or whatever they were doing, I'm not quite sure, you could call it investigating, but they uh, said that these objects were Google Loon balloons. And I guess that's the new skyhook, the kind of go-to thing to try to debunk something or, or write it off without doing your due diligence. The interesting thing here, 
after I spoke with the FAA multiple times is guess what? They hadn't launched Google Loon balloons in Northern America at the time. They weren't launching uh, five to seven balloons. And the balloons, Google Loon balloons, fly at a certain altitude, which wouldn't be visible to the human eye. They don't fly, uh, you know, it, it, just, it was all so ridiculous. And they also, you can get transponder data, which there was none. So, hmm. But anyway, another great case that took place over the Salt Lake Valley. And now I'm going to kind of turn my attention back to the Uinta Basin, Skinwalker Ranch Territory. Uh, we've heard a lot from Chris Marks. We're going to be hearing a lot more from Chris Marks. And we have been investigating and researching and doing trips. We're planning a trip. Apparently, we're going to go up to Heber. But Chris worked for Bigelow Aerospace and had spent, lived six years uh, at, at Skinwalker Ranch, and he is here tonight. We're going to talk about a case that he worked on when he was working up there, and it is a case that has not been revealed really truly until now. And so, Chris, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Erica. Yeah, no, I appreciate you <clears throat> you being here, and I appreciate you know you've really caused quite a, a stir in in the community, and you've definitely pushed some boundaries, and I appreciate that. And you've also, you and Chris Bartell were on the show. That was a great show. I'd love to get Chris back. You were talking about your ideas and thoughts about things when you were up at Skinwalker Ranch. And I, you know, I mean, it's, you've done a really cool thing. And I know it hasn't been easy because there have been a few uh, haters out there. You know, it's interesting because we never intended to cause a stir. That That's not the intention. What was the intention was to... Uh, shine a light on um, what we experienced up there, um, not third party, but what we actually experienced, what we saw. Uh, Chris Bartel and I worked uh, many, many rotations together as partners. We were very tuned in to one another. And uh, I guess the stir occurred because people have a, a preset belief system. Um, what they, in, in their own minds, they believe uh, following others, uh, this, what they hear is fact, because it has to be because uh, the people that are telling them this are the godfathers of the area of the ranch and the projects, even though, and I know this firsthand because I, I was up there and so was Chris and there are others that are coming forward. And we can attest to uh, that, no, they actually were not up there. Um, we never saw them. I just met with a, uh, a former scientist um, that was in my team uh, in Las Vegas, uh, this actually three days ago. And we sat there for five hours and uh, he's a, a PhD and he was within the actual uh, science team of BASS. And him and I worked several rotations together, and we just started, you know, discussing things from different angles. And there are other scientists coming forward from the BAS team, and um, we are going to paint the picture of uh, the perspective that we researched and we experienced Um not based on, on on a book that was written 30 years ago, uh, but what really happened between 2010 and 2016. I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into what happened prior because I wasn't there, but I can definitely attest to uh, what happened while I was there and while Chris was there and while my uh, um, other colleagues uh, were saying and are saying, and like I said, we are reconnecting. There are three... Uh, additional bass people that I'm talking to right this moment that are going to be coming forward. Um, so yeah, uh, bass is very much alive again, and we are bringing forth the perspective from 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 our view. And then that's important because you were actually there, you lived there, and you have. You know, a, 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 an important perspective, and you also have a lot of respect for that area. And I think, unfortunately, like I mean, this goes across the board, not just in ufology, but when you have little things that, that are thrown out, you get this cult. You know, it's like the Skinwalker Ranch cult. 
of people that um, kind of dig in their heels and and think that this is their territory and they get you know it's like mob wars. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, uh, but I I think that it is it is important that you are all coming forward and there is a very important story that needs to be told about that. Um, I will say that. You know, I, I think that the book that came out, I mean, that was, it, it, I really enjoyed that book. Um, it sparked an interest in me. And so I appreciate that. Um, oh, so did I. I mean, that's what really, uh, really sparked my interest. Um, and it, it was capturing. And I can, and I said this before, a lot of the uh, eyewitness accounts that were detailed within that book, I did experience myself. But interestingly, what's really interesting is over the years, and now we're connecting with the, the scientific team of Bass and reconnecting with um, the other uh, uh, researchers and investigators and so forth. Um, our view angle is beginning to change. At this point, several of us are wondering, um, what did we actually, what was this all? Is it, I, I'm just going to throw in there. Is there a possibility that there is man-made phenomena that was thrown in to other phenomena? When I say that, I'm, I'm diving into facts I've recently, lear recently learned uh, that are relating to OSAP, um, weapons research that Bass did get granted between 2009 and 2011. Um, when we were working on the ranch, we didn't even know that we were part of OSAP. Um, I'm learning more and more about OSAP. I'm learning more about the, the weapons uh, testing that has potentially taken place at the ranch at that time. Right, and potentially. That's potentially. I, 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 like, I, I, think, like I said, again, I, I don't you know, know for right, sure. Right. It's, it's all at this point. I'm just putting this out there that there are other avenues that we're looking at. Uh, there have been studies done. There were uh, contracts awarded. And so we are just looking loosely into uh, gathering evidence that would maybe shine a light on right. a whole different angle than what has been uh, – preached for, for so many years, and some of the experiments that were conducted uh, didn't make sense then, um, don't make sense now, unless you put them in a different perspective. Right, and this will be interesting, and I think that we've got a lot um, to learn. I know it has been an interesting process for me to have, you know, the, the first time I talked to you, um, to hear your stories, and then to watch as, as now all of a sudden all the more information is coming to the surface because you came forward, people are reaching out to you right. and, and more dots are being connected and more questions are being raised. And so this is going to be a really interesting learning process. And you and I have both been uh, documenting this um, and, and taking video of kind of, you know, because every day it's just like, okay, <laughs> I go to bed with a different idea yeah, in yeah. my mind about this. It is, there's so much, so many smoke and mirrors. And I think that it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it'll be interesting. There's no doubt that there's something very, very unusual taking place there. I mean, this is, it's, it's, we've heard um, some great stories. I've interviewed a lot of witnesses who have had very real paranormal, quote unquote, experiences. Um, it's not a, not a different thing from other places in the world where you have the same types of things, but then you throw in this other aspect. And so how do you really do due diligence and make sure you're, you know, not, jumping into a belief system, but you're getting all the facts to present. And I think that's what both of us are trying to do with regard to this, to kind of shed some light on, on the ranch and, and that area. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, it's interesting how, like you said, our, my angle and as well as yours, um, cause we do talk about this a lot. It, it seems to be changing on a daily basis. Um, what I believed when I came into this uh, five, six months ago, after not having been involved with the ranch at all, uh, has totally changed. I'm, I'm looking at different aspects, different avenues. Um, 
I'm getting more and more information that that opens a whole different realm of uh, the you know away from the boogeyman and and all of that stuff. There there's more to this. There's a lot more to the story. And interestingly enough, um, like I said, I'm I'm getting uh, emails from uh, people that are have have been dormant. And not just emails like as far as hey this is good or what what not, but I'm getting uh, documents sent to me. I'm getting research uh, papers sent to me. I'm getting the sent to me from within Bass and from uh, uh, exterior sources that have been following other aspects. And uh, also, what what kind of almost points to the. What's going on is the more we push into this direction and look into this, the more pushback we appear Absolutely. to be getting. Absolutely. Um, the more people are resolving to levels that have not seen before. Um, this has now reached legal realms. Right. Uh, lawsuits have been filed and there will be uh, possibly more down the road. And so it, it is becoming something that we're getting a lot of pushback. And on, on a small denominator, I mean, I just, uh, do you remember several weeks ago, I got a, a glitter bomb? Mailed yeah, to yeah, me? actually, and this was really interesting. Chris uh, received a, a very strange package in the mail. Yeah, it was a, a glitter bomb. And um, when I opened it outside, which was, you know, yeah, it was comforting. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> that was, it was just the strangest thing. But then in there, there's a little insert that says it's got a, a devil, you know, with this little pitch thing, fork. pitchfork. And, um, you know, it says ruined days on it. I mean, it was clearly sent to you know it's yeah. not not in the best interest it was a you know whatever just some obviously idiot trying to play a prank but i mean the things have definitely picked up we're stepping in a hornet's nest and that is quite evident by some of the the uh things that are taking place some of the attacks that are taking place against both of us and and other people involved in trying to do good things so it must mean we're, I guess we're onto something. I believe so. I mean, <laughs> all of a sudden, um, I'm getting emails to my personal uh, private email um, that is not public information, but right, apparently, right. Uh, you know, somebody right. has gotten a hold of it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the uh, glitter bomb was addressed to my uh, Las Vegas address, and uh, that's not public. I mean, I guess you could, it, it, it's somewhat, but it's not like, you just stumble up on that. You have to do some research. You have to like spend the thirty bucks to get some program to get somebody's uh, believed right. address. Oh, um, we've got to we've, we've got to take a break. We're okay, gonna cool. Get ready to to go to a break here pretty quick. But yeah, I mean, I think that there are definitely um, there are games at hand, and there I uh, I think the. Uh, people are being steered uh, to kind of create you know, a lot of distraction and to discredit and things. And it's really unfortunate. Um, actually, on, on that, uh, if you have time real quick, I actually believe at this point that there are people out there that are actually uh, out there just for the purpose of of uh, disseminating uh, propaganda or false information right. and to steer the narrative away from uh, what may have really taken place up there. And... I think it's a lot more than what meets the eye. You know, absolutely. I think there is too. And I think the more that we sit down and, and look at timelines and, and look at, you know, who was where, when, and how things were put out to the public and it is quite shocking. And it's also very interesting uh, to see some of the, the other people that have kind of hung their hat on, on that, you know, I mean, their claim to fame or whatever, and, and they don't like to have their territory infringed on, but I, which I think is um, pretty petty. <laughs> I think there's more to this. <laughs> I absolutely think there's more to I this. I think there's absolutely. a lot more to this than I what do meets, too. I don't, I think, I, I thought it was just about territory and financial gain and careers, but the more I'm, I'm looking at documents that, that are actually, you know, they're, they're real, uh, and the more I connect dots, um, the more I believe, yes, part of it is going to be a career type saver type thing. 
But I also believe there is more to this, and I think there are more players uh, involved in this than than is really apparent. Absolutely, and I think that you know, I mean, I've been doing some research um, and for for a while, putting the pieces together and and seeing different narratives that have been spun in the UFO community to try to distract people. Um, and it's 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 been it's very clear, and there are a handful of people that are behind this. And yeah, so yeah. I, I hope that people that are getting into this for the first time, don't just turn to the biggest, brightest, shiniest thing uh, with the, you know, it, because it's, there's more to this. People have to be smart enough to look, to understand and to step back and realize they're being manipulated. Well, all and that they, is absolutely <clears throat> wrong. I mean, all they have to do is look at the newest and shiniest organization that's out there that's uh, spearheaded or, you know, uh, uh, by uh, a person that has been in the public spotlight for a while, a way back. Um, if you look at the who's who in this newer or newest shining star of, of research, if you want to call it that, organizations, and compare it to the makeup of Bass, and compare it to the makeup of NIDS. And you will be finding the same people in pretty much all three organizations. They migrated from one to the next, and now they are in the newest and shiniest. And I truly start to believe that there is, this is not by coincidence, and there is a lot of steering the public opinion and it also has to do with securing funding. It all comes back to money. Uh, there are a lot of different things that are intertwined. And like I said, the more we get into the, the backgrounds of this, the more pushback we're getting. And some of the stuff is really under the belt line. And it's really, uh, it becomes to the point where this is no longer just fun and games. Um, I think we open a door that I'm definitely not going to close. <laughs> um, just going to put that out there, but it's going. It, it's getting uncomfortable for some people, and uh, at some point, when I do have enough, uh, it's going to get even more uncomfortable for um, some people. And it's interesting to see how they push the lowest denominator as their first line right. of defense. Right. Uh, the the useful idiots that are running crazy at this point. But uh, there's going to be more, and it's it's unraveling. And we have started something not knowing um, in the beginning because it was just about ranch stories. But there's more. There is so much more. And the more we are finding out, the more we get support from the most unlikely of people and unlikely of places. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't believe how many um – incredible people have reached out to me i mean from all over the world and, and people that are that that know they have, have i mean this is this show our shows together our interviews together have been listened to by some people <laughs> that are the, you know the best uh yeah you know, people in the world in my opinion uh, people i respect a great deal and so it, it's amazing I, we're gonna play a tape when we get back um the best is yet to come. I like to say that, but it's kind of true. Each yeah. segment gets better. America Luke's here with Chris Marks. We'll be back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Luke's. Erica Luke's. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lutz on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Stars. Woven throughout the universe are keys to a hidden message. Awaiting a voice. A voice that can decipher their coded meaning. A cosmic connection to the cosmos. Tune in to the KCOR Digital Radio Network at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern for Cosmic Connection. Cosmic Connection. Cosmic Connection. Cosmic Connection with astrologers Caroline Lynch and Merlin Wizard. 
Your weekly astrology reading is but a phone call away. So call Cosmic Connection Sunday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and get your free reading today. Cosmic Connection with Caroline Lynch and Merlin Wizard exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. There is a world outside that which we live in. A realm where fact and fiction collide. The Paradigm Matrix. The Paradigm Matrix. Hosted by Willie Miranda. Every Friday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very world. The one-hour show that will surely leave you hanging on the edge of the rabbit hole. The Paradigm Matrix. Explores a universe of topics from UFOs, cryptozoology, conspiracies, as well as all things paranormal. Enter a world of the twisted and deformed. Friday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Paradigm Matrix. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Where fact and fiction collide. One, two, three, four! To the KCOR Digital Radio Network. I love the way it sounds. Love the music. I listen all day. The future of radio is here and now. The only. All right, class. Let's hear what everyone did this weekend. Jill? Well, I raised my older sister to a big oak tree. It was at least a hundred years old. My mom said I must have set a record or something. And then we went down by a stream and perched up on this huge rock and saw all these little minnows swimming around way below us. And then I rescued my little brother from an evil slug king who was guarding him at the bush fortress. And my sister and I brought him back to our super twig fort for safety. And then we all laid out and told stories until it got dark. And the Big Dipper led us all the way home. Awesome. Where were you, Jill? Yeah. We went to the forest. It's not that far away. Anyone want to come this weekend? <laughs> Ask your parents to take you and your friends to the forest this week and find the fun, adventurous you. It's closer than you think. Check out discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. You're listening to... You're listening to... You're listening to... UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> to be on with Erica, call 702 702- 425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chats at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to the last segment of UFO Classified. I want to thank all of my friends for supporting the show. I am having more people come forward to to donate to the show all, all the time, and it really means the world to me. This is a listener-supported show. I choose to do that because I don't want to be beholden to any advertisers. I don't need to... Um, be influenced or get or have my narrative uh, steered in a, a specific direction. I want to do this from from the heart and from I want to get good information forward. You can go to ufoclassified.com to uh, to pledge to the show. You can also go to KCOR. I want to just on that note give a shout out to T. Marie who is the best station manager. Very she works so hard and I just I love being on KCOR. I'm proud to be on this network. I want to also just thank Jen and Adrian, who are two wonderful women here in Utah who have both had experiences. And Jen is doing a really, really cool thing in Heber. She had experiences and she's actually had the bravery to come forward. And as a result, people are 
flocking to her and they're sharing their experiences. And that is really powerful. Chris and I are going to be going up there to interview people. I can't wait to do that. And so if you have any information, if you have any sightings or experiences that you have had in Utah, please make sure you reach out to UFO Classified or you can find me on Facebook, share your experiences. It is important that we collect all of this and document it and try to make some, try to push some boundaries and, and do good research. I am joined tonight again with Chris Marks by Chris Marks, who has done some pretty groundbreaking interviews, uh, never before stories about being at Skinwalker Ranch. And we have both been receiving some pushback as a result of calling things out and and uh, understanding there's probably more to the narrative that has been pushed out to the public for a long time. But there is something very, very real and very important taking place up in this area. When Chris was there working for Bass, he had the opportunity to, uh, opportunity to interview a woman. And I'm going to let Chris kind of lead into that and tell us about your experience interviewing this witness in the area. Um, we Part of what we did was not just the ranch, but we would also interview uh, people that had uh, witness accounts or eyewitness accounts uh, at some point, and this is probably for a uh, later show. Uh, I investigated a, uh, a traffic accident um, that took place just uh, where the Mesa comes down at Dead Man's Curve. Um, I was qualified to do that, having done this with the, the sheriff's office for you know almost a dozen years, and then later on as a uh, uh, a military police investigator. So I, we frequently would um, go off site and talk to uh, people and interview them. Uh, one of the, the greatest places was to go to, it's now no longer, actually it's changed ownership, but uh, Gypsy Mama back in the day was an antique store that was in Fort Duchesne. And um, one of the most wonderful places ever, because it wasn't just an antique store, uh, the owner, who was just fantastic, um, it would be a, a like a, a meeting place for locals to share stories. And it was during I would I would spend a lot of time there uh, talking to uh, hanging out with the owner and talking to the people that came in. And so it just so happened the owner told me hey there's a lady that was here she was a former uh detective uh in a southern california law enforcement agency and she had quite a story and she actually wanted to talk to us about it or talk to me about it and so i ended up uh, meeting her and i we taped an interview um that was uh it was quite Eye-opening. It was great because a lot of the stuff that she said was exactly parallel to what happened at the ranch. So I, I started building up uh, quite a, a large uh, group of people that uh, would like, contact me if they heard anything uh, that was out of the ordinary, and I would then travel to them and and tape record. I mean, interview them, tape record it, and so what you are about to hear is uh, the, the part one of one of such interviews that we conducted as Bass. Uh, I don't think many people know that we actually investigated uh, much more than just the ranch. We investigated uh, the basin. Uh, we also investigated internationally. I mean, Bass was quite a big organization, uh, and it wasn't just the ranch. I mean, the ranch was part of it. But so anyways, uh, here's an interview with a part one of an interview with a person that I met at Gypsy Mama and then connected with. And I think she really thought so then, but I still think the story that she has is remarkable. Yes, Tina, if you don't mind, if you could play that tape, that would be great. So after moving in and experiencing the uh, failure of your camera, what did you experience next? Shortly after moving in, it was probably within the first six months, I noticed, a, uh, I want to say it was a person out in my pasture towards a row of trees. 
I couldn't really tell, it was large, I couldn't really tell what it was, and I called my husband in, and we walked to the sliding glass door in the den, we both looked, and at that point, it was in, going into a crouch position, the upper portion looked like a wolf, I said, and, and after I stood there, my husband stood there, we discussed it, we couldn't really tell what it was, but it looked as if it had changed from a human to a wolf, and, and then just disappeared. And that was a clear uh, line of sight from your sliding glass door to the south? Right. It's about 13 acres between us. Okay. So when you first saw this person, uh, he, where was he coming from? He was coming from the east, which would be my neighbor's property. Is that a wooded area? Yeah, it has Spanish olive trees. Did, do you think the person or the, the uh, thing ever realized that you were there? didn't look at us. I don't think it noticed us. We were we were inside the house, and I don't think he noticed us at all. You described to me earlier when you first saw him, or it, it came out of the wood line and then started to, to stride, and at some point started crouching and, and like, putting its arms out straight. Well, it came out of, I was at my kitchen window when I noticed it. The dogs were barking. And so I looked out the window, and I saw this come out of the tree, and it had a long stride. It was a very large person, being. It looked like, to me, when I looked at it, it looked clothed. I mean, I, I didn't see any nudity, per se. Um, and then by the time I got around the corner to the sliding glass door, it looked as if it was going down into a... Uh, what an animal would do when they would run. They were lunging forward with their, with their front arms outstretched. And then by the time it hit the ground, it was a wolf, a large wolf. Did, could you make out the color of it? It was tan and black, mostly tan with black undertones. And how long ago did this happen? This was, we've been here six years now. It was the first year I lived here. So about six years ago. At dusk time? Yeah, yeah. Then it uh, ran off to the uh, <coughs> to the um, to east, west, to, to the west. west, into the trees, and disappeared. It was very quick. Did you ever look for tracks? We had gone out there. We hadn't seen any strange tracks other than there was some fox prints out there and deer print um, or dog prints that we had taken out there. Um, there was a set of bobcat prints out there, but there wasn't. I didn't feel it was correlated to this at all. Did you have any uh, physiological changes that you can remember, uh, elevated heart rate or anything well, physical? I was pretty excited. Um, my husband was pretty excited. We both looked at each other and, and really didn't quite understand what we had seen. We hadn't heard anything about skinwalkers. Um, so we just kind of thought, well, it must have been not a large wolf that we saw. Maybe we just didn't see it clear enough. or So we just kind of ignored it. And your husband has a military background, uh, so, you know, he, he would be able He's to... He's pretty rational. Right. Yeah, he's very rational. What did he think he saw? He thought it was... He, he didn't know for sure either. He, he just... We both discussed it, and we said, well, it must have been a wolf. That's the only thing we could come up with. It just... It didn't make sense, what we saw at first. So we just kind of agreed it was a wolf and let it go. Was that nearby the burnt-down... Uh, cabin in the back? It was between us and the cabin. The cabin was further back, behind the trees. This was in front of the trees. Uh, was that the only time you saw the something like that out here? No. Um, just this last winter, I want to say it was February of this year. It, it, it's still snowing here. I let my border collie out the front door, and I sent my other two dogs out the back door, which is customary because my one dog has longer hair, and I don't want the snow to be brought in. Right. Um, so my two dogs, which is a hound, Catahoula, and an um, Australian Shepherd, started barking, and I went out, and I looked to where they were barking, and I saw a human shape by the front, and I heard my other dog frantically barking from the front porch. So I went to the house, and when I got to the front porch, all I could see was the back of a bear heading um, south into the pasture and disappeared. I didn't see any tracks. I didn't smell anything. Uh, I it was, it was getting dark, so it was really hard to distinguish exactly what it was. So I, I kind of put it aside, and then a couple weeks later, I went to the pawn shop and saw a bear pelt and realized 
like a light bulb came on. That was it. That's exactly what I saw. But it was just the back of it. Did you hear any sounds? Did this thing make any noises at all? No, no noises at all. No. Just was there. Just was there. Do you think it knew that you were that you saw it? I think that my dog scared it. I think it it startled it um, because she was very aggressively barking at it. Something I've never heard her do as a as a border collie. She's very friendly, and this is more of a uh, her dog's fearful bark, uh, aggressive fearful bark. And I think that's what startled it. As this thing was running off, it was running to the south. Correct. correct? Um, there's some pretty heavy brush. Did you hear it making, rusting any leaves, stepping on branches? There was probably three foot of snow, and oh. I didn't I didn't hear it, even the snow crushing. I didn't hear anything. And no tracks in the no snow? No tracks in the snow. I immediately went over to look, and there was no tracks. I've had bears here before, and I could smell them, and I could hear them. This I couldn't smell, and I couldn't hear. So that is, uh, that is just a portion, a small portion of an hour-long interview that you conducted with the witness. And it is very interesting to hear her. I know at another point in the interview, which I will be, I would like to play uh, more of that next week, there is mention of a mist that is seen in the Russian olives and specific things that I know from my own personal experiences and from compiling research that these things have, have been witnessed and documented by other people in the area. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, what I thought was, was really interesting was the way she was very rational about what she had observed and how she was telling it. Um, there were a lot of parallels and uh, it, it was really, this took place, this interview in 2011. Um, there's so much more to this interview that, you know, over time we're going to be putting out and there are more interviews uh, that, that we conducted. But she is explaining a pattern that happened at her place, which is uh, just west of the ranch. Uh, she can actually see the ranch. It's in a distance. Um, but she experienced a lot of the same phenomena or the same uh, experiences that we had right there on the ranch. So, yeah, it was it was pretty, pretty remarkable. And, 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 and that's the crazy thing. And it's it, interesting because both of us have done our own investigations. Um, I have mentioned this before on many shows. And if you get to hear me lecture, I, I play portions of interviews that I've conducted with a family, um, three generations of people who live in that area, who have had absolutely remarkable experiences. And if you go back to UFO classified and you look at the archives, oh, about a year and a half ago, I interviewed, again, the family um, that has been so inspirational to me and, and that I've kept track of and documented for, for a long, long time. And their, their experiences are incredible as well. And so it's really neat to be able to have all of these things and then to go back, as you say, and you know, you you look at things maybe five years down the line that and then all of a sudden another lightning bolt hits you because it's like, aha, I didn't get that when I was actually conducting the interview. Now things are making sense and things are falling into place. Right. Well, uh, when we when we actually play other parts of this particular interview, uh, there was one thing that was amazing where we heard uh, her horn in her truck, uh, which was locked up, start honking very irrationally but with rhythmically and it's actually on the tape you can actually hear it and as we walked to investigate because we we're in the middle of having this conversation uh as we walked past her it was i think the bedroom uh on the far right side of her uh house uh all the electronics came on like the tv started coming on um the radio started coming on alarm clocks started coming on and there was nobody in that room. Uh, we were, this all like hell broke loose <laughs> as we walked past it. Uh, so, but it's going to be actually, it's, it's captured on this recording, which makes it really interesting. 
Another thing that we did is we placed game cams uh, on properties with consent of the owners, of course, uh, surrounding the ranch and throughout the basin. And then they would be planted and we would collect data like once a month or so and then looked at footage captured. And some of the stuff that came up on those game camps was just mind blowing. Um, this was, these were people that were not necessarily connected to, to anything paranormal that we simply asked, hey, do you mind if we place like those big ranches? We uh, place a, a game cam uh, in your far corner of your property. Um, yeah, we got some really interesting footage out of that whole basin area and put a lot of time and research into that. And it's like I said, which angle, some now the angles are overlapping, right. uh, how to look at this and what it may have been. And so, I mean, with regard to the footage that you caught on the game cameras, what types of things were visible? Uh, mostly uh, humanoid shapes. Um, often transparent um, to certain levels and uh, sometimes objects that we couldn't really place that were not just a single picture, but there was a succession of pictures of like, uh, I hate to use the word orb because it's beaten to death over and over, but orb type um, objects that actually were documented having a moving pattern by a series of seven or eight pictures captured on the game cam. And so this the, you this was documented not only at the ranch but outside of the ranch then, correct? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, the ranch was probably like two thirds of the, the actual research, but there was a good 25% that, or one third that we conducted uh, away from the ranch in neighboring, uh, you know, uh, residences and, and areas. And so you, you had mentioned, I know both you and Chris had mentioned on the previous show that um, there wasn't a lot of funding that went into equipment at the ranch. At what point did the game cameras come into play? When did you guys put them on the ranch? The game when I when I got there in 2010, there were probably I want to say 15 or so game camps. We deployed some on the ranch, and then uh, if we had projects going on, we would take them and and deploy them wherever we could find a contract. Uh, you know, somebody allowing us to use their property. Um, so there were about 15. I mean, there wasn't much more like more sophisticated gear up there. There was uh, you know, a thermal imaging device and a night vision device and stuff like that. But as far as actual uh, research equipment, there was very little. Uh, this is why we started bringing our own in order to conduct research. And so, I mean, were, were there, I mean, it, were there specific places that you placed the game cameras outside of the ranch that seemed to have more activity? Yeah. It, it usually, um, I'm not sure who, who organized the, the place of placements or the location of placements and how that all worked. That was, I wasn't involved in that. But I believe uh, what had happened is people would contact Bass uh, at the home office and say, hey, I got some stuff going on here that I can explain. And then we would go out there and, and place game camps and kind of do a basic study of the environment and uh, see if there was um, any sort of, of uh, electromagnetic wave or pulse activity or if there was a waterway nearby or if it was wooded. I mean, there were certain factors we looked at and then decided on where would we where, where we'd get the, the most bang for the buck in placing of the cameras. And so, who who reviewed the footage? Uh, we did. I mean, the person collecting it uh, would go through, and then we would uh, send the images that we thought were of importance 
uh, back to uh, headquarters in Las Vegas. And so can you describe, you know, we've got to get ready for show clothes, but can you describe an image that you collected that really, really stood out to you? Yeah, yeah, there's one uh, that was remarkable. Um, it depicted a, a person. Um, he was dressed in like an old fashioned type garb, uh, wore a hat, and he was translucent. And we had a succession of five, six pictures of him where he would walk into the view angle of the camera. Um, then he would pause, then he was walking again. And I think it was picture number four where he actually stared straight at the camera. Uh, but you could also see the, the vegetation through him. I mean, but then again, he was clear enough we could identify what it was. And uh, like I said, not just a fluke picture, but there were six or seven or a series of pictures right. that showed him in movement and actually uh, gaining until he, he came into the camera angle and then he exited uh, on the far right of the camera angle. And so after you collected those, after you reviewed that and you saw that, did you write a report up or did you just send the footage to the higher ups? No, we would actually do a quick uh, summary of um, synopsis of what was captured. And then uh, we would send the pictures along with the synopsis uh, to headquarters. And what happened from there, I don't know. But um, these were some, we caught some really interesting stuff. Uh, game camps placed off site and game camps placed uh, on site. Was there ever any feedback from higher up? Not to us. Uh, it was a one-way street. Information would go up, but nothing would ever come back down. So that was just the way it was. And, you know, we accepted that, well, military. So we're like, okay, that's how the way, that's the way it goes. It goes up the chain of command. It doesn't roll back down. Interesting. Well, I, I, I will tell you that this has been an interesting ride to, to have, you know, our, like I said, our initial conversation to have you on the shows to do different interviews with you you've definitely sparked something and shown a light on an important area important research and also the way that this area has been manipulated and unfortunately um we're receiving some blowback because of that manipulation but we will continue to persevere and i know that we'll be exposing more and more i look forward to having you on the show again and again and we're going to go up and do some great investigations in heber and all sorts of places in utah so i want to thank everybody i'm erica lukes you can stick around for a great night on kcor william miranda is up next you can go to ufoclassified.com to check out the show and we will catch you next week listen very carefully this is houston say again please <laughs> This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, Visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a 